Greetings students and welcome back to my lecture series on quantum mechanics. In this video we're going to get started with what is probably the most well-known quantum mechanics equation and that's Schrodinger's equation. But before we get to Schrodinger's equation I want you to think back to your classical mechanics glory days. Suppose I had a particle P that was constrained to move along the x-axis. Suppose also that I was applying several forces to that particle, so let's say F1, F2, all the way to Fn, all of which generally depended on the particle's position x and the time elapsed t. If that were the case, then we could find the particle's position x as a function of time using Newton's second law. But the acceleration a can also be written as the second time derivative of position, so we end up with a governing equation like this m times d2x dt squared equals the sum from i equals 1 to n of f sub i of x comma t. And this is what we would call the equation of motion. Once we solve this equation for the particle's position, we could infer many things about the particle's state, such as its velocity, its kinetic energy, and so on. Sounds simple, right? Well, you'll be pleased to hear that quantum mechanics isn't that different. In fact, the goal of quantum mechanics is to solve something called the Schrodinger equation, which is i times h bar partial psi with respect to t equals negative h bar squared over 2m times the second partial of psi with respect to x plus v times psi. But now, instead of solving for the particle's position, we're solving for something much more special than just position, and that quantity is called the wave function, which is written as psi over here. Now although Schrodinger's equation looks really complicated, the terms aren't very difficult to understand. The first term on the right hand side represents the kinetic energy operator on the wave function, while the second term represents the potential energy operator. Notice how I mentioned operator here, and that's because in quantum mechanics you generally don't get fixed numerical values for kinetic and potential energy. You need to perform operations on the wave function to extract those kinetic and potential energy values, and that's what these operators do. So you can think of Schrodinger's equation as a statement of energy conservation. Kinetic energy plus potential energy on the right hand side equal the total energy which is on the left hand side. Now let's go back to the wave function. You can think of the wave function as something which represents the state of a quantum system. Specifically, the wave function is related to the probability of finding the particle at a particular region in the domain which it occupies. In fact, the square of the norm of the wave function gives you the probability density function of the particle. If you integrate this norm squared over the entire domain, you'll get 1. This is just like saying that adding the probabilities of all possible events gives you 1, or 100%. Now this normalization condition is just the analog for that except now it applies to continuous functions, so instead of adding you integrate. So for example, if I had a norm squared of a particle's wave function that looked like this, then integrating that norm squared from a point A to another point B would give me the probability of finding the particle between point A and point B. If you're used to classical physics, this might seem really weird because what I'm saying right now is that given the wave function, it is impossible for me to tell you with certainty where the particle will be at a particular point in time. Rather, I can only tell you the probability at which I'll find the particle in certain regions. So if you took a measurement of the position of a particle that has this example wave function, there's no way for you to know exactly where the particle is. You can only make educated guesses based on the probabilities of finding particles within certain regions of the domain. So for instance, you could say that it's likely you'll find the particle near the peak of this wave function distribution, and it's unlikely you'll find the particle at the dip in the distribution. However, you can't predict for certain what position you'll measure when you actually do make the measurement. And it's not just the position of the particle which is indeterminate. Other quantities such as its velocity, momentum, kinetic energy, etc. are also indeterminate. And you don't know for certain what those are either. You can only make educated guesses based on the probability distribution of the wave function that you have. Now this isn't the only twist with quantum mechanics. There's one more thing. 
Well, actually, there's many more, but one, we'll cover those if we get there, and two, discussing them all right now would take really long, and that would defeat the purpose of what I'm going for, which is a really basic introduction. Anyway, here's the twist. When you take a measurement of the particle's position, you get a value. Suppose that value is right here, somewhere between points A and B, that I'll call Q. But what if you take another measurement immediately after on that same system? Well, instead of getting something completely different elsewhere in the domain, you'll get the same answer. And if you keep taking measurements very quickly one after the other, you'll keep getting that same answer Q. But wait, how is that possible? If the particle's position is supposed to obey a probability distribution that covers multiple values, how do I keep getting the same value after measuring so many times? Well, it's because by taking a measurement, I'm actually changing the particle's wave function. So instead of being a probability distribution that covers multiple values, by taking a measurement, I change the wave function to a delta function, with one spike at what my measurement gave me. So with one spike at Q. If I keep taking successive measurements on the same system, this delta function doesn't budge, it stays there. And that's why you keep getting the same answer. However, if I let the system settle so that it eventually occupies the original wave function it had, and then if I take my measurement, I might get something different according to the probability distribution corresponding to my original wave function. The name of the phenomenon that occurs when the particle's wave function changes to a delta function after a measurement is called a wave function collapse. Now here's where I review some really basic concepts in statistics. The reason we need this review is that the wave function, as we discussed above, is related closely to a probability density function. So if I have a probability density function p of x, which in quantum mechanics is related to the norm squared of the wave function psi, then the integral of p over the entire domain, or the sum of all probabilities, is 1. And this is the normalization condition that we talked about earlier. I can also use the probability density function to find the expectation value of x to the n. Additionally, I can use the expectation values of x to the n to deduce the variance or the uncertainty on the variable x. Hopefully these rules are simple enough for you to pick up, but don't worry because we'll do practice problems later on in these lectures in case you don't understand them. Let's go back to the Schrodinger equation. Recall from your PDE knowledge that when solving a partial differential equation, we also need auxiliary conditions in order to determine the unknown constants that you get from the integration process that's inherent in solving a differential equation. So by auxiliary conditions, I mean initial conditions and boundary conditions. However, Schrodinger's equation doesn't come with your typical boundary conditions that you might be used to seeing. Instead, the auxiliary condition we have on our solution is the normalization constraint. Solutions to the Schrodinger equation have to be normalizable because they are wave functions, and wave functions, in a way, represent a probability density function. If the solutions to Schrodinger's equation are not normalizable, we can't use them to represent a physical system. For example, the trivial solution psi equals zero is not normalizable because its integral from negative infinity to infinity will always be zero. It can never be one, which is why psi equals zero is an unphysical solution because the particle has to be somewhere. So let's say we solve Schrodinger's equation and we get a solution of a times f of x comma t. The process of normalization is to find the value of the constant a so that the solution obeys the normalization condition. But we might end up with a bit of a difficult task. If the wave function psi is dependent on time, in other words it has a different shape for different times, then wouldn't the normalization constant change with time as well? The answer is surprisingly no. If you normalize the wave function once, then you do not need to normalize for other times. In other words, the normalization stays preserved. This is a theorem that I'll prove, and it's not very difficult to prove. Recall that the norm squared of a wave function is just the complex conjugate of that wave function times the wave function. The complex conjugate is there because wave functions are generally complex. If we go back to Schrodinger's equation, then we can see that the complex conjugate of the equation would be something like this. 
with all the sighs turned into their conjugates and all the imaginary terms with their signs switched. The goal of the proof is to show that this normalization integral doesn't change with time, it stays the same. And the way to do that is to take the time derivative. If we can show that the time derivative of the normalization integral is zero, then our proof is complete. So let's do that, let's take the time derivative of the integral. Now we can replace the psi squared by psi conjugate times psi and stick the derivative inside the integral. And if we differentiate within the integral, then recall that the total derivative with respect to t becomes a partial derivative. Now, let's use the product rule. The derivative of a product of two functions is the first function times the derivative of the second plus the second function times the derivative of the first. And if we use the two forms of Schrodinger's equation for the normal wave function and for the complex conjugate, we can substitute for the time derivatives in this expression. The potential energy terms would cancel out, and we'd just be left with the kinetic energy operators. Now let's take this and plug this back into our integral. From here we can use integration by parts on both integrals to simplify our expression. And if we use integration by parts, we'll find that these integral terms would cancel and we'd just be left with the boundary terms. Now because the normalization condition has to be obeyed, the integrals of the norm squared of psi have to be finite. And in order for the integrals to be finite, we need psi and psi star to approach zero as we go to negative infinity and infinity. If they didn't approach zero, then the integrals would not be finite and the normalization condition would not be obeyed. And as a result, both terms are zero. And therefore, the time derivative of the normalization integral is zero, which means that the normalization integral stays constant with time. And that means the nature of Schrodinger's equation is such that the normalization is always preserved, and so we've completed the proof. The implications of this theorem are that once you've found the normalization constant A once, you don't need to find it again. Because normalization is preserved, you're done. And that's probably a good point to end this video at. I'd just like to finish off by thanking the following patrons for donating at the $5 level or higher to my Patreon. If you would like to become a patron, I put a link to my Patreon account in the description and you can support me there if you wish. So that's it. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan, signing out.